Frenchie's Art Gallery, located on historic Oak Street beside the Maple Leaf Bar. With over 3,000 square feet of space, it features a large gallery front room and Frenchie's personal art studio. Frenchie's Art Gallery is also connected to the Maple Leaf Courtyard, which is ideal for the New Orleans night scene. Frenchie's Art Gallery, 8314 Oak Street. Yeah, you're right. So here's the bottom line. say that. Uh, let me tell you. Good evening and welcome to another jam-packed edition of Primetime Sports. Hey, we had so much fun last week. We had Carl the Mailman Malone. We also had new LSU head coach Will Wade and of course the governor of Louisiana John Bell Edwards. But this week, hey, we are riding down that information superhighway. I cannot wait for the show. We're going to have in-depth discussions on the start of the Saints OTAs. That's right. It started today. The Pelicans, their look for next year. What is this team going to look like? And that red-hot LSU baseball team. And speaking of those Tigers, what they accomplished this weekend was nearly remarkable. They swept Mississippi State on the road at, at Duty Noble Stadium. That never happens. It's only the second time in history that it's ever happened for LSU. But after a 10-8 SEC start, rather pedestrian, they won 11 of their next 12 games to win yet another SEC title. Remarkable. And I cannot believe it. They did tie Florida, who won the East, and they play in the SEC tournament tomorrow afternoon. Hey, by the way, UNO and Southeastern, they're going to match up against each other in the Southland tournament tomorrow. Matt Reiser's team might just get an automatic bid regardless of how they do. Tulane, by the way, they played this afternoon. Hey, don't forget last night, the Golden State Warriors became the first team in NBA history to start the playoffs at 12-0. Remarkable. And only this became the second franchise from the Western Conference to go to three straight NBA Finals. That's only happened by the Lakers, who did it six times. And by the way, LeBron and the Cavs, well, they were 10-0 to start the playoffs. They did lose a heartbreaker to the Celtics, but it looks like they're going to go ahead and, and win it. They play tonight. As far as this show, I've got one of the best, Julie Emanuel from Little Big Shots. She is a remarkable little ball handler and basketball player, only seven years old. She's going to be here along with Fletcher Mackle to cover the Saints, Jake Madison on the Pelicans, and Christopher Dave to talk about the LSU Tigers. Coming up next on Primetime Sports. Wow, that was amazing. A little cross between Steph Curry and my favorite Pistol Pete Maverick, and that is Jalea, of course, who we talked about in the open, and she is going to be coming on later in the show. I cannot wait for this little girl who was on Little Big Shots last month with Steve Harvey. It's going to be a great segment, but right now, we're sliding down the information highway. Last week, we had a bunch of big-name guys that have played you know, sports in the NBA. Of course, new head coach Will Wade and the governor of Louisiana. Hey, this week, we're going information with the guys that have it the best and the guys I know very well. And we're going to start off with the Saints because their OTA started today. That's right, the media won't be able to get in until Thursday, but it all began today. So we're going to kind of go over what the Saints are looking at with Fletcher Mackle from WDSU. He's been a guest on here a few times before. And welcome back, my friend. Thanks for having me. And look at the memo. I don't usually use that term, but we do have. If you call about waist up, we are looking exactly the same. Blue and white, a very safe combination. And we're going Jesuit colors, ironically, <laughs> for two guys that didn't went to their rival school. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the Saints right now. Right off the bat, I kind of have to get into the NFL draft. And 
and I haven't talked to you since it happened a few weeks ago. So what did you think about the draft as a whole? I don't think you can be disappointed in the draft. Look, I'm one of these people that doesn't go extremist one way or the other. I know people want to give them an A, and I know yeah. people want to say, oh, right. it's a C minus. I really am one of these people, and I, and I love having opinions. But I don't understand how people jump out the gate and yeah. say, this is the best draft ever. I, I just always think back to 06. In 2006, all the draft experts hated the Saints draft because yes. they said, well, they got Reggie Bush. They hit the home run with Reggie Bush, franchise savior. But, but. Roman Harper, a little bit of a reach, probably just a, a locker room guy. Who knows what he's going to be? Jari Evans, small school guy. Marcus Colston, they were talking about him being a tight end. Zach, Zach Street, Street, who's nobody, still on the team. <laughs> nobody even knew about right. it. And it becomes the greatest draft in, in franchise history, the foundation for all success. Um, then in 2010, after the Saints won the Super Bowl, they had guys like Patrick Robinson, Charles Brown, um, Matt Tennant, the best center in the draft, Sean Canfield, this developmental quarterback who's going to become the next Tony Romo right. under Sean Payton, trade up for Al Woods, and it's a total bomb of a draft. The only player was the guy who was the developmental guy, Jimmy Graham, who turned Jimmy out to Graham, be right. really right. good. So, look, I like this draft. Marshawn Lattimore was the best cornerback. Ramchek was one of the best offensive tackles. It's hard not to like what they did. I really like Marcus Williams, the ball hawk safety. Love him. Love him. Right. It, I, I think Hendrickson could be a really quality player that people aren't giving right. enough credit right. to in the third round is an edge rusher. So I really like this draft. But will it become a successful draft? I, I don't know. It's such a mixed bag with the history of Mickey Loomis. You go back three years, every, every draft pick, including Brandon Cooks, has been cut or traded, gone. In, but then you go back to last year, where they seemingly have, have replenished, so to say, with Sheldon Rankins, Michael Thomas, and Von Bell. What a draft that was, or appears to be. But 2015, I kind of, you know, I'm always the optimist, as you know, so I was kind of defending that draft, and everyone said it was horrible, and ended up being terrible. So sometimes the fans are right, unfortunately. Yeah, and look, and here's the thing. I think Lattimore is going to get a chance to start right away. Right. I think that's good because the Saints need help in the secondary. And when you watch him on tape, you say, wow, this guy looks great. But he really only has one season as a starter, and he has had some issues. I hope the, the injury issues are in the past. And in the one year, he doesn't get exposed a little bit by some veteran quarterbacks. So I'm excited for him. And, and again, I certainly think Hendrickson's going to have a chance to come in and contribute immediately. Well, get people excited about Lattimore. What do you know that he does well that, that can work for the Saints team? I think he's uh, a starting caliber cornerback, which is something this team hasn't had. I mean, when you think back to last year, they're starting Ken Crawley right. at cornerback in game one, a, a guy that was an undrafted free agent from the University of Colorado. I mean, you have to sign Sterling Moore to play cornerback for your team, who is a street free agent. You have a guy that most draft experts and most scouts say is going to be or has the potential to be. I mean, his floor is starting caliber cornerback well, his ceiling is he has the potential to be an elite level cornerback that's what i'm saying league. if you look at his tape even mm -hmm. if it's just been one year he has that it factor it's i mean he's got it i mean he looks like Deion sanders out there the way he, now he doesn't have that speed and that swagger but he is a mini Deion. the way he kind of carries himself on the football field there were you couldn't find a mock draft that had him getting past san diego at seven i mean i saw some that had him going as high as is two to san francisco three to chicago uh, i mean six to the jets it was hard to find any draft that had him getting to 11. So when the Saints get that kind of value, you have to say they had a tremendous draft because, again, of the value of these picks, where the experts, the scouts, the people that do this for a living had them graded. I think the Saints, you know, were thrilled to death to have Lattimore, Ramchek, Kamara was a second-round grade. He goes mm -hmm. in the third round. Yeah. I mean, Williams is a guy who's, you know, was a second-round grade, and they got him in the second round, but I think – you know, he, he's a guy, I, I'm really high on him because I looked at him at the University of Utah and I just said, boy, man, this guy just seems to be making plays he's left and play. right. I did two games this year for Fox for Utah, with Utah, and that guy is a difference maker. I mean, he, he, you just know guys that are ball hawks. I mean, we expected that to be, obviously, Jarris Bird when he came over. Yeah. This guy is young, he's hungry, and I think he's going to be the guy. But the other picks, that uh, there was one guy that everybody kind of frowned on. They were like, why didn't we? I oh, wish Duke Riley would have fell, but it was Alex Anzalone. So what do you think about this connection? He looked good, at least at rookie camp, I'm hearing. Yeah, let me say this. We didn't get to watch rookie camp, but I watched him at the Senior Bowl and when we went to Mobile for a few days, and then obviously at the Combine. And you look at him and you say, wow, he's, again, 
he's got an injury red flag because he was never able to put that full season together at he's Florida. He's a specimen, though. But when he played, I mean, look, yeah. coming out of high school in Pennsylvania, he was one of the top defensive prep players in the country. Yeah. And you're right. When you watch him, you go, wow, this guy checks every box in the eyeball test. And, uh, and so, yeah, if he can stay healthy, they may have a better player than Duke Riley. I know that people get so upset when the, right. the Saints don't right. draft LSU right, right, guys. Right. You know, Debo Jones. It wasn't their fault. He wasn't there. He, right, it was. That's what right. I mean. I think it's more of the way the draft right. felt. I mean, look, people people harp on Odell Beckham. They couldn't have drafted Odell Beckham. Team they had 12. to trade up just right. to get right. Brandon right. Cooks. And, and so the way it's fallen over the years, it just hasn't worked out. And uh, so I would have loved to have seen them get Duke Riley. I think they would have taken Duke Riley had he not gone one pick before. But if Anzalone can stay healthy, he certainly seems like a guy who has the potential to be very productive. Well, let's segue there. Since you mentioned Duke Riley as a linebacker, what is the linebacker situation? You bring in Manti Teo. Obviously, A.J. Klein, who's been a backup, obviously, to Luke Keekley over there in Carolina. But what do you see in this linebacker situation? There's a lot of guys going for some spots. I was going to say, last year it was so set from OTAs, through training camp. Last year, they had six linebackers, and we knew who the six linebackers were going to be. LRB on the weak side, it was Laurinaitis right, in the middle. Yeah. And then we were talking about Stephon Anthony moving to the strong side. Right. And then you had Robinson, Stupar, and Matt Maudy. You had those three guys as backups. Now, Robinson and Stupar ended up moving into much bigger roles yes. because Laurinaitis and Stephon Anthony didn't, didn't work out. out. Right. But here's the thing. All of those guys, except Laurinaitis, are back. You added a player out of the Canadian Football League. You drafted Anzalone. You signed Teo, and, and you signed... Um, A.J. Klein, right. I think they signed A.J. Klein to be their starting middle linebacker, yeah. to be the guy who filled in once Keekley went down against the Saints with the concussions. He certainly looked like he's a player on the rise. You know, they brought James Laurinaitis in to be that smart quarterback on the field last year. And, and I think from an intelligence standpoint, he was there. From a physical standpoint, he obviously didn't have it anymore. Right. And, and that's why he's now retired. I think you look at Klein and you say, we're catching a guy 26 years old, on the way up, that even if he's not Luke Keekley, he's going to be a quality starting middle linebacker for us that can get our defense aligned and that can make plays. And, and I think if Ellerby's healthy, I mean, the last two years he's been the best linebacker on the team. It's just keeping him healthy. He's always injured. I wouldn't be surprised if, if Anzalone can supplant him if he can't stay healthy in, in OTAs and, and in training camp. This is just a bold prediction on my part. If If... Ellerby can't stay healthy. He may be one of those surprise cuts because maybe it's just time to move on. There's going to be a few. Right. And <coughs> then, you know, you look at Teo and you say, look, he's played all over. I, he, he was a middle linebacker yeah. at Notre Dame, but does he play on the strong side now? Does Stephon Anthony still have a future here? What is the role of Craig Robinson and Nate Stupar now who were forced into duty last year? Again, it's, it's a ton of depth at that position. How it's Interchangeable sorted. parts, too. You got combinations you don't yeah. know. Because, I mean, obviously, we, nobody really thought that Robertson, who was a cover linebacker on the outside mm -hmm. before he came here, all of a sudden he played pretty well on the inside. Hey, speaking of uh, another defensive need, you know, everybody was talking pass rusher. You got Okafor, mm -hmm. who's linebacker slash pass rusher, defensive end. Uh, obviously, he's going to get that spot to try to go opposite Cam Jordan. But he, there's a lot of competition there, obviously. It seems to be every year. What are your thoughts there? You mentioned Trey Hendrickson. There's Okafor. Obviously, Kikaha. Yeah. Wh wh what do we got here? Yeah, I look at Okafor, and, and I hope they've got a low-risk, high-reward guy. You know, obviously, going back to his days at University of Texas with Kenny Vaccaro. there, yeah. Right, and, and he had, uh, you know, his ceiling was real high. And he's, uh, you know, for whatever reason, various reasons, never lived up to what the expectations were. Maybe this is his breakout year. Maybe, look, Nick Fairley last year came in on a one-year prove-it deal, so to say, and he proved it, and he cashed in, and he looks like he's going to be a cog on that defensive line. Right. Maybe Okafor is, is that guy this year. I, I just I hate to get excited because the Saints do this every year. Every team does this. Bring in these guys on these one-year prove-it deals or these one-year kind of— One day it's going to work. Well, it worked for Nick Fairley. <laughs> right, right, you know, I mean, it's worked in the past right. for guys, but for every success yeah. story, there's one that Laurenitis sure, is right, one. Right. There's for every success, there's a failure. So, I'm excited about Okafor. I see him more as a sub package guy. I, I think Hendrickson is going to get the chance to, it, to to emerge as that guy. Now, maybe I'm too high on him. Maybe I'm expecting no, too I'm much out of a rookie. Too. Very but high. When you look at him, and I understand he played. You know, for Florida Atlantic, uh, you know, a team that didn't exactly play big boy competition yeah. week in and week out. But I am excited about him. In Kikaha, we've always liked. Love him. But look, three ACL surgeries know, on the hard. same knee. Sean Payton even acknowledged last year when he went down in minicamp that it's hard to come back from two. Three is a real, 
a, a real stretch. You, you saw the other guy in that picture, Anthony, because, yeah. I mean, we know Kakaha has to deal with the knee, but Anthony, it seems to be in his head. Where are we at with him? I, I don't know. I mean, first round pick two years ago. Yeah, and you're starting to look at him as the first round bust now. And obviously, for whatever reason, he is not on the same page or he is not picking up what Dennis Allen's doing. You know, Rob Ryan, they drafted him. They made Rob, Rob, Rob Ryan switch from a, a, a fourth, from a 3-4 to a 4-3. And so they made him change what he was doing. And so he, uh, he was the guy who came in right away on that on that middle linebacker position and was supposed to be the guy to call the signals, to call the plays, to do everything that he was going to do. And, uh, and he started right away for the Saints and led the team in tackles as a rookie. And, and then, obviously, Dennis Allen took over 10 games in, and that's really when his role diminished, is when Dennis Allen took over um, as the defensive coordinator, and he was never able to kind of find his footing last year, so to say. Last thing, you, you, you mentioned Dennis Allen right there. Is this the year they come through? And also, do you believe and you still trust in the brain trust of Mickey Loomis and Sean Payton? I, I do. I mean, for right now, I do. I think that Dennis Allen, I'm, I'm a big Dennis Allen fan. So Absolutely. I, I really like Dennis Allen. I think he's going to be a head coach in the Jim league Brown. again. I think he's going to be, uh, you know, a, he is a good defensive coordinator. I do think even if they don't have a top 10 defense, I do think he's going to be able to put the right pieces in place. And for right now, I still do believe in Sean Payton and Mickey Loomis. Look, three straight losing seasons, bad drafts. You know, some questionable free agent signings with Browner and Spiller and in in Jarris Bird, more injuries for him. But I still do believe in them. But if they don't turn it around this year, you know, maybe I'll start to waver on my belief in them. Four losing seasons gets a little difficult, but they still did bring the Super Bowl here. Yeah. By the way, you did. know you know this place. Uh, you know the owner Evan Hayes yeah. from Shays Dallas Shays. Obviously, you've also Dallas Shays. Check it out. I think you can use it at both places. But thank All you right. once again, brother. No, thank you. Fletcher Mackle right there. By the way, he is part of that Hall of Fame team that was announced earlier. That's right. Jonathan Vilma is now in, along with Jay Romig and, of course, Carl Nix. That's right. Four, four years in New Orleans, but two of them he was on the NFL All-Pro team, three Pro Bowls. He's a great player. Hey, coming up next, we're staying on the Information Highway. We're going to talk to Jake Madison from Berber Street Shots. We're going to get what is going on with the Pels. Now they have their leadership firmly in place for at least another year. What are they going to do to make this team better? Coming up right here on Primetime Sports. Welcome back to Primetime Sports, and there she is again. Look at Jalea. She is phenomenal, and she is coming up next right here in Primetime Sports. Don't forget my debut guest, besides her being the first time ever on this show, will also be the last segment. That's Christopher Dabe from the Times Picking You, NOLA.com. We're going to talk LSU. We're going to talk all things LSU, but particularly the baseball team, which just had a huge run to go 11-1 in the SEC to end the season after a pedestrian 10-8 and start. All that's coming up. But right now, well, here's a guy we've seen before on the show. Between Lyons Jelen and Fletcher Mackle, who was just on the show, and my next guest, Jake Madison, well, these are the only guys I've ever had on this show more than twice because I love their information. Not that I don't like everybody else's, I do. But these guys I know and I know well, and I trust everything they say. And here he is again, Jake Madison. Bourbon Street Shots, how you doing, my friend? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. And I seem to say this every time, New Orleans and Louisiana, everybody, Baton Rouge, and everybody else that loves the Pelicans around the state, Lafayette, Shreveport, wherever, uh, if you're not on BourbonStreetShots.com, you are completely missing out. I love all the rags that talk Pelicans, but this one is the one that gets most in-depth, and they know what they're talking about. So I'm giving you a plug because you deserve it, my friend. <laughs> I definitely appreciate it. All right, let's talk about the Pell situation. We obviously know this has been kind of a, a, you know, a, a crazy run lately. You know, we had the playoffs two years ago. Everybody was excited about the 45-37 and 37 team. Uh, they, they didn't win a game against the Warriors that year, but they did play pretty well in the playoffs. It's kind of been downhill since. What are your thoughts? 
you know, it's been downhill a lot due to injuries and right. just not having the right amount of talent. The year after they made that playoff run, Drew Holiday was out for a period of time. Um, Anthony Davis had season-ending surgery, but now all of a sudden they find themselves in the most pivotal offseason they've had in a very long time, and that's because they made that trade deadline move to bring in DeMarcus Cousins, kind of go a different direction than the rest of the NBA is going as a whole with two big men rather than playing small. So this offseason, free agency, even potentially the draft, is going to be huge with long-term ramifications for this franchise. Well, we got to talk about the first guy because their free agent is Drew Holiday. They took a big chance on him. They, they traded two first-rounders to get him uh, a few years back. Now he's been here four years. Uh, he's had some injury problems, but when he has been on the court, generally he's been very good. Is he worth re-signing for a max deal? Not for a max. He's going to be a really interesting case in free agency where he is up for a max contract. The Pelicans might have to give it to him to re-sign him and keep Explain talented. what a max deal means for those who don't know. So the way it works in the NBA and the salary cap, a max deal is a percentage of the salary cap that's indexed off of that. So it's not just a dollar amount, it's a percentage. Holiday's up for 30% of the salary cap, which is a lot to be given a guy who's going to be your third best player on the team. And yeah, he has good numbers, he plays right, but you saw towards the end of the year after they made this DeMarcus Cousins trade, he was kind of pushed to the outskirts of this offense. Looked centered. a little lost at times. Looked a little lost. Yeah. They started playing him with Tim Frazier, another ball handler, to help cut down on the turnovers, right. not put all the playmaking duties in his hand. And he was relegated to a bit of a spot-up shooter role, someone that you could fill elsewhere. So do you want to pay $30 million to a guy who's just trying to take open threes on kickouts from your two bigs? The other problem is, though, if he doesn't re-sign, you're losing some talent, and you need to try and convince DeMarcus Cousins to re-sign after next year. So maybe you've got to pay him to keep him here and keep talent on this roster. One thing you know, if you're going to have a big three, one of the big three has to be a guy with the ball in his hands. Everyone through history has had one, even if they aren't a guard, for instance, or maybe a point guard, I should say. Michael Jordan was part of big three, but the ball was in his hands all the time. LeBron James, ball in hand. Uh, obviously, as Kyrie as well now, but I'm even talking when, when Wade was playing off the ball in, in, in Miami. But y when you get a player for this third player, if it's not Drew Holiday, what are some other guys that you trust to get the ball to the two big guys that, that are going to be the superstars on this team, Boogie and obviously AD? You know, there's a few names in the free agency that I think would be good fits for the Pelicans that are going to be cheaper than Drew Holiday and fill kind of the same role. The one you're going to hear a lot is obviously going to be Patty Mills, who just finished his playoff run with the Spurs. He's only 28. Uh, he's probably going to be around $12 million. He'd be a good fit for the team. He's fast. He's a very good three-point shooter, so he spaces the court for Davis and Cousins. And they're going to be running a very different offense next season. They signed a new um, assistant coach from Denver, uh, Chris Finch, to run this offense through Davis and Cousins. So you need a point guard who can create in small moments, but who's going to mainly hit threes, and Patty Mills definitely fits that. And ball. Patty Mills is a guy that's always come in and been remarkable, but he's always backed up Tony Parker. Now, do you feel with the, with the weight on his shoulders, can he handle that here? You know, I think he can. He plays, you know, he's averaged more in the playoffs once Tony Parker went down this, this playoff run here. He plays about 20 minutes, 22 minutes a game during the regular season, but he's not going to be the primary guy. That's the great thing about having right. these two bigs. You can take a chance on a guy like Patty Mills because mainly the, the focus of the offense is going to be Anthony Davis, going to be DeMarcus Cousins, and I'd be willing to bet next year DeMarcus Cousins actually leads this team in assists per game. There's another former Spur out there who's been around the league a little bit with the Pacers as well, and most recently the, New, the Utah Jazz, being in New Orleans, I almost said New Orleans Jazz. <laughs> That's how old I am. <laughs> but his name's George Hill. How would he fit on this team? You know, I think he'd be a great fit. That's a guy who is solid defensively, can run an offense, get guys into their sets. That's another thing. You don't necessarily need a great passer, but someone who can orchestrate the offense. Think Chris Paul, who's very good at getting the ball to people in the spots that they want it and kind of pulls the strings for everything. Hill can do that. He's solid defensively. You know, the, one of the bigger strengths for Holiday is on the defensive side of the ball. The Pelicans did rank in the top 10 in NBA defense this year after being near the bottom Shocking. of the league. Shocking. After being yeah. near the bottom of the league the past number of years. So losing him there hurts. You need someone who can come in and help keep this unit at least top half in the league, and Hill's a guy who can do I that. I think Mills would be the flashier player of the two, uh, more electric, uh, but, but the high IQ, basketball IQ of George Hill is also appealing to me as well. That's needed right. on this Pelicans. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, IQ and hustle and off-ball movement, isn't, you know, those aren't adjectives that are thrown around this team a lot. Not Getting lately. a guy like that who can 
help elevate everyone, organize everyone, talk on defense, talk on offense. That goes a long way. You know how chatter gets crazy in the NBA uh, like it does in NFL in any sport, but after the Boston Celtics, without Isaiah Thomas, somehow shocked <laughs> the Cleveland Cavaliers, down 21 in the third, somehow won. They're like, okay, they do have a plethora of guards. Not that Marcus Smart can ever hit three, seven threes again in a game. But they seem to have a lot of guards there, and they do have the first pick of the draft. Uh, and I, I think most people think it's going to be either Markel Fultz or maybe Lonzo Ball, right? Uh, well, does that make a guy like Isaiah Thomas expendable? And if so, I know I'm dreaming, <laughs> but how would he look in a Pelicans uniform with Anthony Davis and Boogie Cousins? Is this a possibility, and how would it look? You never know. So it's going to be interesting because I wouldn't be shocked if they look to try and trade Isaiah Thomas. That game three where they came back to win without him is very Because intriguing. he's a defensive liability. It's huge. You have yeah. to hide him on yeah. defense. Yeah. You have to put him on the worst offensive player, which messes with your rotations. Right. And you saw it again in that game against the Cavs in game three. Defensively, they looked crisper. They looked sharper. They took away what... The Cavs wanted to do when Isaiah Thomas is on the court, but they're not able to do that. Let's talk his positives. How good would he look, though? Oh, offensively in a Pelts uniform. They need a go-to scorer in right. the fourth quarter, and there's none better than Isaiah Thomas in the league right now, Mister Fourth Quarter Phenomenal. King of the Fourth. The Pelicans struggled in close games last year. He's going to be a free agent after next season. I don't think Boston wants to commit a max contract to him with all the young talent but would they you, have on the team. For this, because you mortgage your future to get him, probably. I mean, you'd probably do a sign and trade of some sort. You'd, uh, you'd have to probably trade a first-round pick, but yeah. I think you could bring him in here and see if it works. You, a first-round pick to take a chance on a guy like that? Not that much to give up, in all honesty. Same thing with DeMarcus Cousins. If this fails, they just let him walk and it's okay, we're done with it. But I wouldn't hate the idea of Danny trying to Ainge bring Danny Ainge is in. a tough negotiator, though. He That's get, true. He, he loves to get good first-round picks, and he hit the jackpot with Brooklyn Nets, giving away Garnett and obviously Paul Pierce, et cetera. Uh, and, shoot, it seems like he gave away everybody. But this team needs shooting, too. I mean, Batman. we have, you know, you had Buddy Heald, who was kind of coming on finally after some rookie struggles. You know, Langston Galloway, you, you lost all the shooters to get Boogie. With J.J. Redick on the dysfunctional Clippers, they have like four really good players, but they don't seem to really like to play together. Would this be a fit for the Pelicans? This is a very intriguing option, and I think a very good one. He is a knockdown three-point shooter. You need people to space the court for these two bigs. If you don't have shooters, teams are just going to pack the paint and take away exactly what Anthony Davis and DeMarcus Cousins want to do. You can have those two bigs, but the bigs do need help in the league. J.J. Redick is a shooter who can hit his three-point shots. If he's wide open, you feel very confident that ball's going in. The Clippers, like you said, are kind of dysfunctional. It seems like there's been a cap on what they're able to achieve. Chris Paul's iffy to come back. Blake Griffin might not re-sign. And they might consider blowing the whole thing up, which allows J.J. Redick to maybe come here to New Orleans. Yeah, that thing, and, and I, obviously, I don't know if you saw Jared Dudley. You're a California guy. He's a San Diego guy. He was on an interview this past week on uh, an ESPN show, and he said that was the weirdest group I've ever been with. He's been around the league a little bit, Bucks, Suns, et cetera. He said they don't like each other. They don't. Nobody gets along off the court. And so I could easily see pieces going. And Chris Paul, I know everybody talks about that. I don't, that's a long, long shot. But Chris Paul would be kind of fun to have back, too. Hey, i got to get to our, our, the other guys. You mentioned the other guys. I mean, you know, some of those free agents like Langston Galloway has been traded away. But how do the other guys in this team fit? Dante Cunningham is now going forward and checking out free agency. He had the option. But like the Solomon Hill and Etuan Moore who were signed last year, and they, they're, they're kind of tied in, and, and Omer Ashik. What do you do with them, and how do they fit on this team? You know, Etuan Moore is an interesting example. He came off the bench primarily last year because they needed some firepower on the bench, and they needed that unit to keep up scoring-wise with other teams in the league. I think he'll move into the starting role this coming season, space the court. He's a very they good three-point shooter. Or yeah, like if that. they don't bring in someone else. He can space the court. He's a very good shooter. Dante Cunningham becomes immediately more intriguing to me now that they're going to try and run this new offense that requires a lot of off-ball movement. Cunningham's solid at shooting from the short corner in the NBA. He led the team in three-point percentage feet, yeah. Yeah, uh, last season. And all of a sudden, now his off-ball skills of cutting and trying to get to the rim and receiving a pass become more valuable because that's integral to what the Pelicans are going to do next season. 
Well, you, Dante Cunningham leads your team in three-point shooting. Is that what I heard? Yeah. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> it's, it's a huge That's problem. That's a problem. And speaking of, Solomon Hill, who they got because he got hot at the end of a previous season. Was their big money signing. And he had a couple He had a couple big games, but yeah, they're 82 in the season. You need more than a couple. It, it's, he's not consistent enough. He's great defensively, and he unlocks everything they want to do defensively, being able to guard three positions. But it's the reverse of Isaiah Thomas, where you almost have to hide him on offense. Real quick, the NBA, uh, obviously the Golden State Warriors, first team to ever start the playoffs 12-0 because they had the best three of fives with some of those Lakers mm-hmm. teams. But they are going on to the finals, presumably against the Cleveland Cavaliers, who did lose a couple nights ago. Uh, they do play tonight. What are your thoughts in this finals uh, for the third straight year between these two teams? It's the two best teams. I'm excited to see them get out there and have you know the rematch from last year with everything with it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and hopefully we're going to be in, a go- in for a good series because that's the only thing that's going to make these NBA playoffs watchable overall right now. Hey, check him out. His name is Jake Madison, and it is BourbonStreetShots.com. He is a Pelicans insider, and he's one of the best guys I know. Take your beautiful girlfriend. That'll get you started, <laughs> at least, over at Chase Dillon. Well, I know you've been, haven't there. you? I love that place. We're yeah. going to have a lot of fun. That's great, and, and he is great. They came to our watch party last week. I do appreciate that as well. We had one over at an establishment in the Warehouse District for the Carl Malone Show. Hey, coming up next, well, I got to tell you, this girl is phenomenal. I first saw her in some local news shows, then I saw her on NBC Nightly News, and then I've also seen her on Little Big Shots, hosted by Steve Harvey on NBC. Her name is Jalea, and she's coming up next right here on Primetime Sports. I can't wait. The owners of the Delachaise Wine Bar on St. Charles Avenue have opened up their newest creation uptown on Maple Street called Chez Delachaise, a new local wine bistro featuring a larger menu of small and large plates, a brighter atmosphere, and full table service. Additionally, patrons can enjoy a large patio out front as well as an extensive wine list offering selections from around the world. It's Chez Delachaise, 7708 Maple Street between Carrollton and Broadway. Crescent City Steakhouse, a true neighborhood restaurant operated by the Voikovich family since 1934, is the oldest steakhouse in the city of New Orleans. Serving only hand-cut, prime-age, corn-fed beef for over 80 years, Crescent City Steakhouse has become a dining destination for both die-hard locals and adventurous travelers who seek traditional, timeless New Orleans cuisine. Crescent City Steakhouse, 1001 North Broad, on the corner of St. Philip, in the heart of New Orleans. Well, we've been watching her videos the entire show, and now it's here. And you know what? Normally, other guests tell me they're nervous sometimes. I'm nervous this time because I can't wait for this segment. As most of you know, I love basketball. I love all the sports, but basketball is my favorite. And when I first saw Jalea Emanuel for the first time, I was blown away. It was about a year ago. She was on a lot of local shows, so I started Googling her up, and I'm like, This girl is phenomenal because as a kid, I used to do all these little Pistol Pete training videos, and but I was like 12, 13, 14. This girl was six years old. I'm like, this is phenomenal. And she was even at six, better than I ever was at 13 or 14. I can trust you on that. And probably better than most everybody we all know. Her name's Julia, and I cannot wait. Welcome to the show. So good to see you. Thank you. And this is her dad. By the way, there's a lot of dads out there that have kids, and, and they're these driven, they drive them. This is the most unique relationship I've ever seen in one of these. Jovan Man- Emanuel uh, has such a loving relationship with his daughter, and I could see it in all the other interviews, mm-hmm. but welcome to the show as well. Absolutely. Appreciate you. Thank you for having us. The first thing i got to say, because you were on a national TV show on Sunday night, which is pretty much the most watched night of television, and it's called Little Big Shots with Steve Harvey as the host on NBC. I just have to ask you, You've been on a lot of television, but what was it like being on that show with seen by so many people? It was like the best thing I ever did. <laughs> like, well, now it's the second best, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was the best thing. I mean, was, how cool was it to meet him and, and be on that show, though? 
It was pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, so as far as the other stuff, I did, what I didn't tell you is, you know, Tim McGraw is a big fan. He shared a video and he got tons of likes on his Facebook. But guys like Snoop Dogg, you went up to see LeBron James and you met him. Talk about that whole experience because he is, if he's not the best player of all time, he's certainly in the small discussion of a top five player. Absolutely. Yeah. What was it like meeting LeBron? Pretty awesome. Like the first time I met him, I was like, oh my God, I met LeBron James. Like <laughs> actually, I met LeBron James in person. <laughs> and he actually, didn't he kiss you? I mean, and then yeah, like, how long did it take for you to, to wash that face? <laughs> Long time. Hey, by the way, I have these Team Leah shirts. You see the hat that mm -hmm. my man Javon is wearing. Tell everybody what this is about because this is uh, a beautiful thing you're doing right now for your daughter, mm -hmm. and you're going to do some charity work with it as well. Bell Absolutely. Chase is where she goes. Bell Chase Primary is where she goes to school. Mm -hmm. But give everybody and let them know what Team Leah is about. Well, yeah, Team Leah, we started it. Um, you know, we just was thinking about something to do for her, you know, her name, for sure. the brand, you know. And a very long story short, her, the eye in Leah is actually her jump shot. That's, That's her shoot. That's her jumper. And uh, so, you know, we thought it'd be cool, you know, to raise a little money for her for a scholarship fund. And then once the brand, you know, gets a little bit bigger, we're going to give a certain percentage of that to charity, which is like, uh, you know, kids who aren't able to be outside and play. And, you know, it's just something I always, I'm big on telling her, you know, you're very blessed in. You know what She's I mean? amazingly yeah. blessed, and uh, by the way, to have such a nurturing father as well, and your talent's just unbelievable. But listen, as a kid growing up, we all wanted to be NBA players. We all wanted, yeah. but the Globe Trotters was to me as a young kid was the was the greatest. And I, I remember the first time I got to see the Globe Trotters, it was pretty phenomenal. But the first time you got to see him, you actually kind of played with him. You were on the court twice. Oh, yeah. Twice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. doesn't happen. Talk to everybody about what that was like because you were on half court. Uh, during the games with the Globe Trotters. Yeah, that was pretty. I mean, awesome. talk about it. How, how how was it? It was pretty awesome. Like the first time I met them, it just made me like I felt like one of them. Yeah. You are kind of one of them, though. I mean, yeah. honestly, did they kind of say, "Hey, one day yeah. you might be one of us"? Yeah, they all they all they all keep in touch and and, and talk about her and check on her and stuff. We're pretty cool with a bunch of them. Scooter, Fatima. Yeah, I met yeah. Scooter in the um, Steve Harvey show. Yeah, he actually came. That's out. right. Yeah. No, I he saw came him. out. He came out backwards. I never even knew that was <laughs> that was. So he, you were surprised? So, like. Yeah, I was pretty surprised too. Yeah, I was like, yeah. wait, that's Steve Harvey? That's right. Cause <laughs> he <laughs> backed up. That's right. Uh -huh. I remember that. That's I right. I was Absolutely. like, I was like, wait. I, when I saw the real Steve Harvey come out, I was like. Wait, there's two Steve Harvey. Yeah, right, 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 right. Because he had he had yeah, the, uh, yep. mm -hmm. the, yeah. the the fake hat mask on. Yep. Hey, by the way, the the whole the whole leading up to the Steve Harvey. How did you how did you even know to how did they know to get you on the show? Because they just contacted my dad and you know, mm. they saw my videos and they wanted me to come on their show. That's pretty cool. So what was that yeah. like when you got that call? Well, it was awesome. I mean, they, a lot of yeah, them reach right. out to us, but they called us and we was like, and, and it's crazy. I, my wife, I was telling, her, I said. We was watching it. I said, uh, that'd be I pretty cool. Dad, I was, that would be pretty that would be dad, that would be we pretty cool. We all were cool. talking about it. And it would be pretty cool if I went on that show. Mm -hmm. And then boom. Yeah. Well, oh, so you had seen it literally, before, yes. Next, literally yeah. the next day. That is the Lord Damn. works in mysterious I'm ways, doesn't you, it? The next day they contacted us and I was like, Wow. So yep. Well you've been contacted by a few other people yeah. lately. Uh, yeah. let's talk about this one. There's a movie coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. tell me what you know about this movie and who contacted you to be in it. Nick Cannon contacted me, and she the movie's about like it's like a, lo a love and basketball yeah. meets above the rim. Oh, nice! Yeah, it's those two gonna come, come, you know, convert into you know. Can we say the name of the movie yet? Yeah, it's She Ball. No, yeah, She Ball. It's, yeah, it's no secret. Um, 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 Nick Cannon, it's it's all out there right now. Him and uh, well, we had to push it back because he got sick. Yeah, he was sick. So He's sick right now, so, so we pushed the yeah. filming back. But there's some shots of you, uh, mm -hmm. obviously on little big shots, little mm -hmm. baller. Jalea Manu Manuel, mm -hmm. I love it. By the way, what's the Snoop Dogg connection? How does Snoop know you so well? Yeah, he <laughs> saw a video online and he was re retweeting it and reposting it and resharing it online and stuff. It is pretty cool. Like a lot of people, a lot of comedians and uh, uh, rappers. She met Chris Paul and his. They all know him. Chris like, Paul. His yeah. parents. Robin. You know, Robin. Yeah, his Paul, parents. Right. Them uh, actually you know, pulled Julia to the side and introduced him to Chris and was like, this is a little girl I was telling you about. They're great. Cool. The yeah. parent, His parents are great. He yeah. was on a show I did back when he was in high school uh -huh. and he came to Atlanta to come on. It was mm -hmm. interesting. But he's such a good dude. Yeah. So what's it like meeting all these famous people? Like, 
I, it just blew my mind that I could like, I could actually meet them. Mm -hmm. Like I saw them on TV and I was like, I wish I could meet them one day. And then, and then the next week you're there. Yeah. yeah and then, like, I'm like, my mind is so blown right now. <laughs> well, by the way, your influences, obviously you have many, LeBron being one of them, but his teammate Kyrie Irving, but the guy that I think most people compare you to in a lot of ways because your, your drills and everything is Steph, Steph Curry. Mm -hmm. Would you say he's one of your favorite players and why? He's my favorite player because he shoots threes and encouraged me and Aiden. Like, Aiden is my friend. Now he, sh he watched him and now he shoots threes. Mm -hmm. And I got encouraged too, so I try to shoot threes and usually I make them. You usually make them too? Yeah. Well, we know you can dribble, so you can shoot and dribble, which reminds me of a guy that I grew up watching film of, and I went to every game literally when he was here in New Orleans. You're way too young to remember the New Orleans Jazz. From 1974 to 79, five years, there was a guy named Pistol Pete Maravich mm -hmm. that was considered the best shooter, the best ball handler, the best uh, passer, and certainly the best court vision, which a lot of that Steph Curry has now. What do you know about Pistol Pete? That he has a tape. And he could, you know, like do all those tricks. Yeah, tricks. And I watch him sometimes, and I try to do it, and I get it. What are your favorite tricks? What do you like to do? When he spins the finger on his hand, and when you remember that one. Dude, wait, dude, wait, are you kidding me? Is this the one when he and he pops it with his hand yeah, to go in? She, she, yeah. she, 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 she's trying. Yeah, she didn't get that far yet. It's, it's and hard. When you put it on your uh, back, and you. She you talking about like how you pass around. The around, the, around she, the, she's real quick. No, around. like the one when you put it on the back and you clap. And oh, and you catch, you catch it. it. Yeah. And he pops, pops it back over. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, the pistol piece, the, the shot that I put everybody else in horse for like 30 years, you have to practice a long time. You spin it on your finger, and then you pop it in the air, and then, and then you have to punch it in. Uh -huh. That gets everybody out. Yeah. Game over. Right. But by the way, <laughs> but as far as uh, Steph Curry, though, what made you originally like him so much? Because I watched him in. Well, I watched his games and she studied his games. Yeah. She, she recorded I saw on how he does his work and mm -hmm. so I went outside. I I went outside and used to try it and then oh, well, the ball yeah, ball. I used to get it. Well, before we wrap up, who's your favorite female player? Because I know you know a few Brit players from the Mercury. Brittany Griner, John and John Tarasi. Diana Tarasi? Yeah. In fact, she said that she, you're the best ball handler she's ever seen because mm -hmm. I actually gave her a call. Mm -hmm. I mean, Diana Taurasi, perhaps one of the greatest, if not the greatest women's player of all yeah, time, absolutely. gave you that compliment. Mm -hmm. And here, here, here's a place I want you to try. You go get yourself a nice little bite to eat. It's oh, called Shade Cell awesome. Shades. That's for you coming on this show. I can't thank you enough. Hey, Julia, can you... Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Man, this has been fun. We've seen them. you got to Google this stuff up. This is the most amazing thing you'll ever see. And by the way, I want to thank them very much. I'm sure this isn't their last time on this show because uh, I cannot wait to follow her career. Hey, coming up next, we're going to talk LSU baseball with Chris Dave. He is with TimespeakingNola.com. Coming up next right here on Primetime Sports. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Primetime Sports. Wow, what a performance by Jalea. God, I enjoyed her so much. Jalea Manuel. Hey, but coming up next is another first-time guest. We had two guys early in the show that have been here a few times. I don't really have a lot of repeat guests, but first time this time is Christopher Dabe. I remember being with him at training camp. He was covering the Saints for the Times Picking You, NOLA.com, and recently... Well, he got put on LSU duty, so he moved up to Baton Rouge, so he came down I-10 to join us today. Christopher, Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I said earlier in the show this is going to be an information highway show because I wanted to talk about the people that cover the sports today. We talked about the Saints, obviously, with Fletcher Macko. We talked about the Pelicans, what they're doing with Jake Madison. And here's a guy that's been around this LSU baseball team literally all season long and watch this team kind of struggle a little bit by LSU standards early. I told you they were 10 and 8 in conference, but boy, did they get hot Tiger style from the 90s. They went 11 and 1 down the stretch. So I got to ask you first and foremost, Chris, you've been around this team. What have you seen 
that did you first of all did you see this coming and secondly what have you seen to make this happen well you know it was a little bit difficult to really see this coming like you said they were sitting at 10 and 8 in conference play and they were having some struggles uh, starting pitchers weren't going as long in the games as they wanted offense wasn't producing but as LSU has done in recent years under Paul Maneri, they seem to turn it on in the second half of the season. Something seems to happen where things kind of click, and that's really what's happened now. They've won 11 of the last 12 SEC games and have gotten some good pitching performances. The bullpen has really come into shape with uh, Zach Hess um, being a, provi providing a good, yeah. being a good setup man sure. for Hunter Newman. And, uh, and then uh, the line has been producing lately, especially the, the well, lower half. I've, I heard somebody say it best recently. They said they, mid-season, a national guy was like, they just didn't seem to have that it factor. There was something missing from this team. But when you look at it now, they really seem to have the pieces. I mean, they, they got the gritty guys, you know, the guys, some of those guys in that picture, like Duplantis, Robertson, and Freeman. Grit. You have the big bopper and Dykeman, and you have the pitching staff led by all-SEC pitcher Alex Lang, second-time all-SEC for LSU. Obviously, Jared Poche, he seems to have been around since the Bush administration. Uh, and also, <laughs> you have the freshman Eric Walker. They seem to have the pieces to possibly make a run now. They, they certainly do, and you mentioned the three starting pitchers, and that third starting pitcher has been something that had been missing at LSU in recent seasons. The freshman Eric Walker? The freshman Eric Walker yeah. being that third starter, and that's something Paul Maneri said at the very beginning of the season. He wanted to develop a third starter uh, just uh, for this purpose. So you get into the postseason play and you get into tournament play and you have these situations where you need to win four games. You need, and without that third starter, you're not getting to that, necessarily getting to that. Yeah, and you know, we, the LSU, they like winning SEC championships. They are, they're all about winning. They've won plenty of those. But this team is all about winning national championships mm -hmm. and right. it hasn't had a whole lot literally i mean i was around a lot in the 90s when they won five i mean from 91 to 2000 and they've only got one and maneri's got one in 2009 as you see right there can this team do it i mean i know at lsu i i always try to tell fans world series enough should be making you happy and and i'm happy when they get to the world series i think that's quite an accomplishment but around here unless you bring that hardware home they, think, they seem to think you had a disappointing season. Is that fair? I don't think it's really fair to think if they don't win the World Series that it's a, a failure of a season. Now, there certainly is the expectation to get to the World Series, and if there is uh, the thought of disappointment and not getting there or that should be the expectation, then that is what it should be. And the players at the beginning of the season, they put that on, on themselves right away. I think uh, Kramer Robertson was asked, why did you come back to LSU? He, he got drafted could have gone to play professionally, and he had a one-word answer, and that was Omaha, and that's all they want to do. So that's the main goal, just getting to Omaha. Kramer's yeah. a special case yeah. because his, his lineage. I mean, his mother, who I used to play pickup with when she was young, was a U.S. Olympic gold medalist. She was a national champion basketball player at Louisiana Tech when they were balling in the early to mid-80s. I mean, she was something special. And she happens to win a national championship herself as a head coach mm -hmm. for Baylor Bears. So... That guy, he's got this, this growing up of, hey, you're either champion. Hey, you're Ricky Bobby. If you ain't first, you're last, right? <laughs> so you know him. He's a gamer. What's he like in the locker room? Because on the field, he seems especially intense, and he's a winner. Well, he carries a pretty, really good pre – he has a good presence about him. Um, you know, one thing that stood, up, stood out that he did recently, I think it was leading into the Alabama series, right when they got this whole hot streak started and winning 11 of 12 SEC games, the team was struggling, and he put it on his shoulders. He, he said, look, the team's not doing well. I'm not playing well. This is my fault. I'm going to take responsibility for it. He's the leadoff hitter. And ever since then, he's been hitting well. The guys behind him have been hitting well. And other guys have said that, yeah, they looked at themselves in the mirror and said, we're not this team. We're not this 10-8 and 8 team. And it shows now with what they've been able to uh, do. It's been, it's been nothing short of shocking, I think. I mean, I know they had the potential, but when you have guys, I mean, let's talk about Cole Freeman. He could have gone pro. Uh, Greg Dykeman could have gone pro. And I'm going to throw in Antoine Duplantis. These are guys that I would love to see up at any time of the game. I mean, they are clutch players. But what does it mean to have these kind of players for a, a coach like Paul Maneri? Experience, and plus these are all gamers. Yeah, they, they are. And the experience certainly pays in. And, you know, Paul Maneri said it. He could take those guys and put them in any order in, in the lineup. 
and he knows that they would they would produce in, in this the way that he wants. Well, we know we know what they're all about, but what about these freshmen? Because we've had a few that have come in from the beginning. It seems like Josh Smith has started just about every game uh, at third base. He's been around. Uh, but you also have Zach Watson, who seems to be getting hot of late, obviously, and Jake Slaughter. What does this these freshman trio meant for this team? Well, uh, Josh Smith has really proven to be a, a really great third baseman for this team. Uh, I think next year he might be moving over to shortstop to yeah. fill in for Kramer. Alex Bregman style. And, right, and can't, can't wait to see him there because he's a, a rather smooth fielder, as you'll see on the yeah. infield for LSU right now. Uh, Zach Watson, he came on in the middle of the year, uh, got in that starting role, or maybe maybe one-third into the year. Uh, you mentioned Jake Slaughter. He, he had a good start. Uh, kind of tailed off a little bit, and yeah. Nick Coombs has been playing first Nick base Coombs now. Nick Coombs as well, right. And, uh, and that's another thing with this team. We talk about this midseason change that they had. You know, Paul Maneri did a little bit of tinkering with his lineup, putting Zach Watson in there, finding a spot for him. He moved up in the order, then moved down. He's hitting ninth, and he's one of the leading hitters on the team. He's almost like a second leadoff hitter right if, now. If it wasn't for that kid at Mississippi State who is just leading, it seems like, in every category, yeah. Uh, Greg Dykeman would probably be lead, obviously leading in home runs. I mean, he is the big bopper. If he's hitting well, you have to like this team's chances. You certainly do when teams will allow him to hit him well. You they walk him a lot, State, don't they? Yeah. They walked him ten times last weekend, five times intentionally. And actually, I asked him before the team left uh, for Hoover, do you anticipate getting treated like that in the tournament? Will you continue to get walked like that? He doesn't think so. He thinks teams will pitch to him like they have during the season, even though he'll get pitched around. He's going to have one pitch to hit and then he at bat, and he knows he has to take he advantage of it. He can crush it. Yes. I mean, I was at the two-lane game down here in New Orleans, and that ball, it looked like it hit Claiborne Avenue. It was so far. Mm -hmm. uh, it's nice to have a big ball. And by the way, that is the ultimate respect in that plan. Yeah. It didn't really work out too well for Mississippi State. No. Speaking of Mississippi State, uh, LSU was in contention going into that series of who was going to win the SEC West. By game two, you knew they had it. Uh, they had the clutch home run by Papirski, and they ended up winning that. But then they swept Mississippi State at Duty Noble Field. That just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a powerful program, and, and they end up winning the SEC. What are your thoughts? LSU and Florida seem to be at the top of this group at the moment. But how do you think they match up with the Gators because they didn't do so well down in Gainesville? They came back and won that last game. but That's right. And they came back and won that last game. The first game, if I remember correctly, one to nothing. Alex Lang against Alex Fay. Crazy Fayetto. matchup, right. So that one could have gone either way. I mean, Lang threw a complete True. game, shut out, you know, eight innings instead of nine, and didn't get the win. And he, he's four and four in league play with an under three ERA, so he's had some tough, tough losses. They so, did recognize him as all SEC, that's though. Right. So they did recognize he's had some tough ones. That's right. right. So if they do meet up, say, in the SEC championship, I think that's, that would be the matchup anybody should want to see. Real quick, I got a couple things. Matt Canada and Ogeron. Uh, I know you haven't fully gotten it. You were covering the Saints, by the way, with mm -hmm. time speaking. You came to New Orleans about two and a half, three years ago, covering the Saints. I was with you at training camp, like I said, in West Virginia. But now you're on the LSU thing. You're in Baton Rouge. What's that like? I mean, you're going to be immersed. Baseball is one thing, and that's big. Yeah. Basketball, not so big right at the moment. But football is king here. Talk about this and Matt Canna's influence on Ed Ogeron's team. I think uh – Matt Canada is just the kind of offensive coordinator that Ed Orgeron wants or needs. He wants somebody who's going to take over the offense and do everything, you know, make call all the shots that, on that side of the ball. Um, looking forward to seeing what that offense can do. We saw a little bit in the spring practices, a little bit in the spring game. But mainly what you saw were some of the shifts and different formations that they might have. But I really think we only saw a fraction of what you're really going to get. I had Will uh, Wade on this show last week, uh, and he seems to be an energetic young coach. Any thoughts on his hiring and what he might mean for the LSU basketball team? Uh, very energetic. I think he had his line in uh, the Tiger Tour where that first meeting he had, half the guys weren't wearing uh, oh, LSU that's right. stuff. And yeah. He said, no wonder we kicked your butt uh, when we played, when DCU played them. Right, so. right, 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 right. Yeah, he said, yeah. no wonder. That, you guys, that's, that's I the like attitude. it. Yeah. That's the attitude. Hey, by the way, uh, I know you're in Baton Rouge, but if you ever get down to New Orleans, that is Shays de la Shays. Give Thank it you. a try. Check it out. I do appreciate you so much here. Tradition, you have not signed this ball yet. I have not. And this is your first time. Why don't you get on right here by restaurant tour, Dickie Brennan and Dino Hansen right there. <laughs> Got to thank him and everybody else, Jalea Manuel. Appreciate her. She was so great. Uh, earlier in the show, and also Fletcher Mackle and 
Don't forget Jake Madison. I want to thank everybody here at WLAE, including Ron Yeager and Jim Dotson, of course, CST, the good folks over there. That's Jeff Brenner and Ashley Coleman. But William Hill, he is our producer. And don't forget everybody that makes it happen behind the scenes. Kenny Juno, of course, Redhead Tsunami, and everybody else here at WLAE. Thank you so very much. We'll see you next week on Primetime Sports.